so you, you left a really, really uh, big social network to, to work for somebody who would have been beaten by, beaten by Clinton probably, but that didn't happen. And now you're, you're, you're bought some dead trees. I bought a media company that still produces some print, yeah. uh, Nuance. print journalism. Yeah, really good new ones. Which is actually... Well, how, how did that idea come up? Um, I, I actually love the print magazine that the New Republic has uh, produced for a while, but it's part of a bigger vision that, um, that I have and that we have for, um, for the future of journalism. I mean, I should say first off, in the United States it's probably a little bit different than it is here in Europe. Um, in the United States, the conventional wisdom, um, whether you love the media or you don't, is that print is dying. Mm -hmm. there's, there's an assumption that five years from now, print, you know, is going to, it will maybe still be around, but it's not going to be in the same way. I know that in Europe, that definitely hasn't, um, that definitely hasn't been the case quite yet. But, um, but I, th I think there are two things. First off is, is a belief that this kind of journalism that we do, which is, which is pretty serious-minded, high-quality journalism about politics and culture, is good for society and is good for democracy. Mm -hmm. So it, there, there's very much a, uh, you know, I have a passion for it because um, I love it, but I think this is the way society works, the way democracy works. We need a well-informed um, populace who uh, can make educated decisions, whether it's what they buy in the store tomorrow or how they vote. Um, so that's the first reason. The second reason is because I do really believe that we can find a way to make high-quality journalism largely consumed through digital devices and screens, uh, sustainable for the 21st century. Um, part of the irony is that part of that solution, ironically, for us, is print. Mm -hmm. Even though it's at a very different point now than it was 20 or 25 years ago, particularly in the magazine space, People love print magazines. I love print magazines. And you, th and you think about it, and this is a room full of technology folks and entrepreneurs, but I mean, it's... Who loves print magazines? It's colorful, it's disposable, See, it's shareable, you. it's, you know, it's... Good technology. Uh, it's light, you can put it in your pocket. It's a good technology, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, and, and probably most importantly, people are still willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. um, so... Um, you know, our assumption is that, and even now, we have millions of people reading our content on their mobile phones and on their screens. We touch so many more people through the web. But um, for a small group of people, in our, in our case, for about 2% of the 2 million folks that we have on the web in any given month, about 50, uh, we have 50,000 print subscribers. So in, in many ways, it's almost a, a freemium model, if you will. You know, the vast majority of people are able to access and do access our journalism for free. Mm -hmm. But a small group who likes a certain kind of experience is willing to pay for it. And that's the group that we need to increase, um, but also uh, really make sure that we're serving well. Okay, right. so let's okay. focus on that later. Yeah. One, one question, <laughs> one question. So when, how old were you when you read your first in the Republic? Sorry? How old were you when you first oh, uh, read the New not Republic? That probably, I was probably in college, so 20, 21, 21. 22. So, and seven years later, you buy the place. Yeah. And uh, I can imagine that you walk <laughs> That's in... That's where he was going with it. <laughs> you, walk, you walk into that, to that editorial room, and there's this bunch of journalists, old dogs, who've been around for ages before you were born. How did they react to you, the, the, the young internet guy? Fortunately, uh, whenever you grow a company, and we've doubled the size, we've gone from like 22 folks to 50 on staff. Um, mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's introduced sort of a new, I think, a new period of, of excitement and vitality um, to the title. I think that, at least most often in the US, and it's probably like this here too, um, most journalists and people in the media world know that they need to evolve. There's a sense that this old model, even in places where print is still robust, that you write an article, it gets, goes to you know, a printing press, it's put on a piece of paper and your job is done. That, that work, that, that's over. You know, now you probably crowdsource a lot of your information gathering, you write an article, you publish it on the web, you promote it on Facebook, you interact uh, about the content on Twitter, oftentimes you'll update it or write another article in response to it, and all of a sudden it means just a totally different media environment and conversation. So I think that at least for us at the New Republic, you know, even the folks who were there when I bought the magazine and continue to be there now know that that that, 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 that there's a new process for 
um, the way that journalism, journalism happens. Um, and for the most part, what, what they need, and I think what most people need, is the tools to do that well and the platform to get, uh, to get significant reach and to get what, in front of the what, people who are making decisions. What is your big, hairy, audacious goal with this? Because it's, it's, it's a weird decision to goal. buy a magazine like that. Well, I mean... Isn't it? A little bit. It's out of... Out of I mean, most people wouldn't think I this think a couple anybody of years ago cares, that you would do this. If you care about the state of democracy, and you care about society, then you have to care about what people are reading. And as much as I love cat videos, as much as I love numbered sure. lists yes. on, you know, BuzzFeed... Yes, we do. Um, that's just not enough but to make our is, society work. So if there's anything counterintuitive about it, it's, I guess, a belief that we need to have a robust, well-functioning no, democracy. I understand. So democracy, well. but this is only a very small magazine. This is not going to save democracy. So what yeah. is... No. No, so, <laughs> no, not exactly. No, I don't think so. But so we, we have to start somewhere. Yeah, but what is the <laughs> goal the enemy, Can't let the perfect be the but enemy. But that's why I'm big. asking, what is the big goal then, practically? I understand that you want to save democracy. We don't need to be the biggest media brand or the media company, biggest media company in the world as long as we can shape the discourse that people are having. I mean, just this, this past week in the United States, we're having a very robust argument um, about uh, gun control. And there was a vote a couple months ago, which would, was just a no-brainer policy. It's a background checks um, for, uh, for those who want to buy guns at, at a gun show or whatever. 90% of the American population support it. It failed. The conventional wisdom is that the NRA, this lobby, is, uh, is really powerful in that, and that no matter what, nothing's going to be able to get done. We released a cover story, which was our second most trafficked article since I bought the magazine, which offered a, a contrasting view, which was well-documented, well-researched, very carefully thought out, and quite long, 5,000 words, that suggests that there's actually a burgeoning gun control movement that is stronger than anything else uh, that, that's uh, existed before. And that has increasingly now become the conventional wisdom in Washington. So if you talk about the big, hairy goal, or you talk about why I'm doing this or why I'm so excited about it, it's that opportunity to you know, shape the, not just political, but also cultural and social discourse that, uh, that we have as a country so that we can, you know, move the ball forward and make the world a better place. So there's this Dutch guy called Derek Sauer, and he moved to you Moscow. Know him? I don't. And, well, maybe you know him. And he started uh, a Russian empire there. And uh, during a speech uh, a couple of months ago, he told us that a young guy from Facebook who has invested in old traditional media was making plans of buying European newspapers because they are a solid investment, according to him. Would you recognize yourself in... News to me. <laughs> no, not, I've, got, I've got my hands full with, uh, with New Republic. But do you agree that, that uh, buying traditional media is a solid investment? Uh, I think if, if you're just looking on the investment criteria, I think investing in a pure internet um, startup that's not content-based is mm -hmm. probably a better investment than any type of content. But it's not just because of, tradi it's not traditional media versus new media. I think content and content companies on the web um, traditionally don't have the same multiples as, you know, tools have. I mean, if you look at what have been big exits for content companies, the one that you know, in the United States, everyone uh, points to is the Huffington Post, which mm -hmm. did sell for uh, north of $200 million a couple of years ago. But um, it's such a unique, I mean, obviously it's a successful company, but in terms of the, the valuation for it and um, the economics of it, I think in, 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 uh, in many cases, it was a really important branding and rebranding opportunity for AOL to buy it in the first place. So, so anyway, I'm... I'm uh, I'm giving sort of a nuanced answer to a simple question. I think that yeah. you can't do it if you just want to make, uh, if you want, want to make a lot of money. I, I don't think that the, you know, the, the New Republic isn't going to be the next Facebook. If you but you're, you're focusing on uh, getting break even or making a profit in 2015. So that's in, in well, last two, question. Yeah, last question. Two and a half years. It'll take us some time. I would, I would, uh, I think Harvard? we could get there in 2015. We'll see. A lot you said depends, it at obviously. What's that? You said it at Harvard during, during a seminar. How are you going to achieve that? We have, it's the, um, the business model that we have is based on two things. The first is providing cross-platform subscriber experiences that make it worthwhile for somebody to pay three bucks a month. 
That's it, three bucks a month, $35 a year. And for that you get wow. you know, 20 issues of print, mm -hmm. you get audio of all of, our, of all of our pieces, you get our tablet app, uh, uh, unlimited usage of that, you get uh, past uh, the metered paywall on the web, you get subscriber-only events, et cetera. I could keep going, but there's a whole set of services that you get for, uh, for that price. And so when I bought the magazine, we had um, 35,000 uh, subscribers. We're now up to over 50,000, um, which is the type of progress that if we, I don't know if, if we'll continue at that rate forever, but that, that's the direction that we need to go to reach a point of sustainability. The second main source of revenue is, is um, advertising and sponsored and branded partnerships. Of course, we have pages in the magazine, and people still buy that, and I think that's a valuable product, but what's even more interesting to us are things like sponsored content on the web, which, uh, which is really, uh, so really I can powerful. Buy an article. And we say very clearly it's sponsored. Mm -hmm. This article was written in collaboration with Pfizer or with GE or the Gates Foundation, et cetera. Like it says sponsored. That, <laughs> it, that's a good example of when it doesn't work. It doesn't work unless it's trustworthy and, uh, and very clear that it's sponsored. We put it up on the top and we All right, put it we're, in. All right, we're going to run it up here.